Good morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, January 12, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Uganda declares an end to Ebola outbreak. I now confirm that all transmission chains have been fully interrupted and take this opportunity to declare that the outbreak is over and Uganda is now free of active Ebola transmission. A court in Guinea acquits the former coordinator of the National Front for the Defense of the Constitution. Tigray forces start handing over heavy weapons as part of peace deal. An overnight outage at the Federal Aviation Administration delayed thousands of flights in the United States on Wednesday morning. Some South Sudan lawmakers are concerned about escalating intercommunal fighting. In this conflict, my people are the ones suffering the most. Yeah, if it continues, of course, then the consequences will be both long-term and also short-term. And warmer king Satyu in Benin has role in sanctions controversy. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The World Health Organization declared Uganda Ebola free on Wednesday, 42 days since the last infection was recorded. The outbreak of the Sudan strain of the virus, which started in September, has left 55 people dead. Alima Atumani reports from the epicenter of the outbreak in Mubende, Uganda. The declaration was made at a function in Mwende district, now known as the epicenter of the fifth outbreak of the Ebola Sudan virus in Uganda. Dr. Jen Rutha Chen, Uganda's health minister, noted that the major drivers of transmission were household infection and gatherings at private facilities. The three main portals of transmission were physical contact, sexual contact, and transplacental transmission. On Wednesday, 113 days since the start of the Ebola outbreak and 42 days since the discharge of the last confirmed case, the country got its much-awaited news. I now confirm that all transmission chains have been fully interrupted and take this opportunity to declare that the outbreak is over, and Uganda is now free of active Ebola transmission. The Mubende district registered the highest number of confirmed cases with 64 patients and 29 deaths. At the onset of the Ebola outbreak, Niger Juliet worked her usual routine as a laboratory attendant at Mwende Referral Hospital. With about seven health workers dying due to Ebola, many health workers were afraid to approach patients. Juliet, who later was to be the Ebola Laboratory Sample Coordinator, recalls that on September 17th, a patient was admitted and tested positive for Ebola the next day. That was the start of the Ebola outbreak and a follow-up of contacts was quickly carried out. I took off those samples. There were eight patients, six turned out positive. I was in panic. I had to notify my lawyers and my family about what might happen. I was traumatized, psychologically tortured, because even my colleagues feared and they didn't even enter there. But me, actually, I knew how to put on the PPE, practice infection prevention and control. That's what saved me. By the end of October, the neighboring Kassanda district registered 12 cases within two days, prompting health authorities to open up an Ebola treatment unit there. Nabu Mamaska, a resident of Kassanda district, has adopted a third name, Kaunao, literally meaning survivor. Maska says she got news of a sick relative who she visited, unaware that the relative had Ebola and would shortly die from the virus. After three days, Maska tells VOA she presented with all signs and symptoms of Ebola, including severe headache, bleeding through the nose, diarrhea, and vomiting. <laughs> she says, when I saw all of that, I called the ambulance and they took me to hospital. She says after that, I lost consciousness for three weeks. She says when I regained my senses, I had health workers say, welcome back, welcome back. Life has not been easy for Maska, who says she has faced social stigma in her village. She says they feared me. 
we were really mistreated when we returned to the community. She says, I was renting a house, but my landlord kicked me out for failure to pay rent, yet I didn't have a coin. She asks, do you know what it means to be surrounded by family and all of a sudden they all run away? She says, I can't afford to buy food. I'm constantly begging, yet I used to own a business and I lost it all. By the end of the pandemic, Kassanda District registered 49 confirmed cases and 21 deaths among the 143 cases and 55 deaths countrywide. Ugandans have been urged to continue being vigilant and report any person in the community that presents with Ebola-like symptoms. The health ministry, working with international partners, says it continues to look for the possible source of the outbreak and the reason why Uganda tends to suffer from Ebola outbreaks from July to October. Halima Othmani for VA News, Mubende, Uganda. Ethiopia's militaries and Tigrayan forces have started handing over heavy weapons as part of the peace deal to end a two-year civil war. Maya Misika reports from Addis Ababa. Ethiopian Federal Defense Force in a statement Wednesday confirmed Tigray forces have started handing over heavy weapons, the latest progress in line with the November peace deal. The statement said the first round of weapons were transported on Tuesday in Agula Camp, 36 kilometers from Tigray's capital, Makale. Ethiopian Army Commander Lieutenant Colonel Alemi Tadela said the arms transfer included tanks, rockets and mortars. The statement said observers from the African Union and various countries' militaries were present to verify the transfer from the Tigray People's Liberation Front. The confirmation came after TPLF spokesman Geta Choreda early Wednesday tweeted news of the handover. He said they hope and expect this will go a long way in expediting the full implementation of the agreement. The AU brokered peace deal signed in South Africa saw the two sides agree the TPLF would disarm in return for restoration of aid and services to Tigray and withdrawal of foreign forces. The deal came after two years of devastating war that saw Tigray largely cut off from the rest of the world, hundreds of thousands of people killed and millions displaced. The two sides have met a few times in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, to discuss implementing the deal. Since December, Ethiopia has allowed humanitarian aid to enter Tigray and restored power, water, banking and telecommunications to the region. Witnesses say in late December, Eritrean troops who fought on the side of federal forces withdrew from two cities in Tigray. However, the TPLF accuses Eritrean troops of committing atrocities during the conflict and says they are still active in some areas of Tigray. Maya Misikar for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Some lawmakers in South Sudan's Transitional National Legislative Assembly say they are concerned about the escalating intercommunal fighting in Jonglia and the Greater Pibol administrative area and are calling on their national leaders to intervene. The MPs say the violence threatens national security and the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement. For VOA News, Deng Gai Deng has the story from Bo. MP Mayen Deng Alier, who represents Jonglei State in the Transitional National Legislative Assembly, says the number of lives lost following several days of fighting in Pibor and Jonglei is shocking. Other than it being a tribal issue between the, the Murle community and, and the people of, uh, of Mayer Nation from Jonglei State, uh, we should see if the other motives other than the revenge attack and all these kind of things. So it is an issue that the leaders from, from the Bibor and the city area and some place uh, should sit down and, and look into. And also the national leaders uh, who are concerned with security sector and, and the political uh, issues, uh, they should look into this so that the situation can be, can be arrested. The latest wave of violence began two weeks ago when a group of armed militia men known as the White Army from neighboring Jonglei state attacked parts of Greater Pibor administrative area. Local authorities say the perpetrators killed dozens of people, burnt homes, stole livestock and caused tens of thousands of families to be displaced from their homes. Aliar says President Salva Kiri should question Lokalia Mayor, the chief administrator of Greater Pibor, and Jonglei Governor Dine Chagur as to why they have done little to control armed groups from attacking their neighbors. The major threat now is the issue of cattle wrestling. What policies can be introduced? to avoid uh, the occurrence of some people going and, uh, you know, taking property that belongs to other people and in the process uh, damaging both lives and property. So it is an issue that is uh, threatening 
uh, the national security in the country. Alier says a parliament were not in recess. The caterates and greater people would be a top agenda item. MP Helen Ngaidok, who represents Gumru County in the National Legislative Assembly, says she is deeply concerned about the violence in her area. I also have family there, have relatives. Like, and in this conflict, my people are the ones suffering the most. Yeah, if it continues, of course, then the consequences will be both long-term and also short-term. The short-term ones will be destruction and, and loss of life, as it is already happening. And the long-term one, of course, we will have trauma, for, especially for those who are affected. And there's also going to be poverty because, you know, in a conflict, of course, like, people will lose property. We'll also lose cattle, which is their main source of income. Naidok says parties to the peace deal are at the final pace of implementing the agreement, but the fighting in Pibor could derail security arrangements and cause a further displacement. The South Sudan People's Defense Force says the attacks and counterattacks by arms groups in the greater Pibor and Jonglei have overwhelmed the army. Military spokesperson Major General Lul Roy Kong says four of the soldiers were killed recently in Jonglei State. The white arm from Greater Jonglei invaded uh, Greater Pibor in thousands. We could not intervene in every front. We only fought by the South Defense. If you could remember, when Gumruk was repeatedly attacked, and that was the only thing that we could do. The same thing in uh, Jonglei now. A lot of attacks are being reported all over in Du County in uh, Uror, in Nirol, in Akobo. And we do not have presence in all the, some of the villages that are being attacked. General Kong says the army was only able to intervene when cattle raiders left stolen livestock near their military barracks. In a joint statement released two weeks ago, UNMIS, the African Union, EGAD, the Troika, the European Union, and RJ make all called on South Sudanese leaders to urgently intervene to stop the fighting in Pibor. For VOA News, I am Deng Gaiding in Bor. The humanitarian coordinator in South Sudan has strongly condemned the killing of three aid workers in South Sudan in Rumamiya village in the Abie administrative area and in Dork County of Jungle Estate. Peter Van de Aurora called for the authorities and communities to protect humanitarian personnel as they deliver assistance to vulnerable people. He extended condolences to the families and colleagues of the aid workers who were killed. Van de Aurora says the humanitarian the Mediterranean community calls on authorities to bring the perpetrators to justice. South Sudan continues to be one of the most dangerous places for aid workers. Nine humanitarian workers have been killed in the line of duty in 2020, compared to five in 2021. Since the conflict began in 2013, 141 humanitarians, predominantly South Sudanese, have lost their lives while providing assistance. <music> You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, January 12th. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The court has freed a former coordinator of the National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, the FNDC. Abdul Rahman Sano had been on trial for having meetings without permission. According to Reuters, the prosecution had asked for an 18-month suspended sentence. But the court said while Sano failed to comply with the regulation, the law does not specify a penalty for violations. The military junta, led by Colonel Mamandi Dumbuya, has banned the FNDC for organizing in what the junta calls armed demonstrations and jeopardizing national unity. The FNDC and the Economic Community of West African States ECOWAS are pressing for the junta to set a transitional timetable for elections and civilian rule. Alpha Freya Barry is a founding member of the FNDC. He tells me Sano should never have been arrested in the first place. It was on Monday. He came to front of the judge and uh, they reminded him why he was uh, in front of the judge. And he, he do recognize that uh, he organized uh, a meeting with uh, some people. And then, based on that, the judge uh, tell him, okay, I know by the law, like uh, one of the articles in our country, which is uh, 621, condemn that. But you have to inform the authority 
before you organize the meeting. But the thing is, in Guinea law or constitution, there is no law that condemns someone who organizes a meeting without informing. That's why the judge makes his decision like the revision. So what what does that mean now? I mean, Mr. Sano, is he free now? And uh, what happens? Yeah, he's, no, he's free. They release him. So yeah, He's free. He went home. But one thing again about Adraman Sano, you know, why they catch him up? Because actually the military build a dictatorship system in the country. Like whoever don't support their ideas and support their feelings like to stay more in power, they're going to try to do things to let you run, like leave the country or put you in jail or intimidate you. Because, you know, the FNDC is uh, now they try to illegally, like, take it away. And Adraman Sano was trying to put a new movement in place, which called uh, the Guinean Citizen Patriotic Movement. And, you know, they are so scared because they know actually people are really in poverty and suffering. And we all are tired with this uh, military. And they are not doing nothing like to get us back to the normal situation. Now, what is the situation with uh, the FNDC? Are you still protesting? No, we are working on a lot of things. Maybe in the coming days or the coming weeks or months, we will project the protest. But uh, it's been like a while. We are working on the diplomatic level. That's what we are doing now. Where are we in terms of the political process? We are at the same level, meaning that... uh, since the beginning, the third big political organization in the country are not associated to any action with the military. Because we all been asking the military and even the ECOWAS and the international community was asking the military to create an environment where we can sit around the table and then dialogue. And they are not doing that. They make it seem like They want to have this conversation, but inside, they are not. Because they are not creating any condition to let us be with them and discuss. Thank you so much again. It's very nice to talk with you. Happy New Year, my brother. Okay, Happy New Year, Mr. James. I'm so thankful like for everything you are doing to let the African community and the whole world understand things that we as Africans are going through in our different countries. Alpha Freya Barry is a founder member of the National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, the FNDC of Guinea. You are speaking with me from New York City. An overnight outage at the Federal Aviation Administration delayed thousands of flights on Wednesday morning in the United States. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration lifted its order to halt all domestic flight departures on Wednesday across the country after it restored its computer system that provides pilots with pre-flight safety notices. The overnight and early morning outage caused thousands of flight delays and some canceled flights. Claire Boucher is the Chicago correspondent for the Financial Times who covers the U.S. aviation and automotive industries. My colleague Carol Van Dam asked her what the government is saying so far about the outage. They have said that it was the federal government has been downplaying the idea that it was a cyber attack, but they have not said what uh, actually caused it. They have said that more information is going to be released later. We understand that there were more than 4,000 delays in or out of the U.S. as of a little before 9 o'clock this morning, according to FlightAware. That's that flight tracking website. Does that track with what you're hearing? Yes. We, we have the Financial Times reported that uh, about 4,000 flights had um, been delayed with 700 canceled in the United States. As far as you know, um, are most of these flights, you know, back up and running on a, on a delayed flight schedule? You know, they are trying to um, to get up and running again. United Airlines has extended a waiver to many of its customers if they need to reschedule or to cancel their trip because of this. Um, but, yes, I mean, the domestic system is slowly getting uh, back to business as usual. Early on, the agency said, and by that I mean the FAA, said the notice to air mission systems had failed, but that some systems were coming back online. Do you know any more about that? 
Notice to air missions is a alert system that tells pilots about hazards that they might be facing uh, all across the United States at various airports or on various routes. And it feeds in information from hundreds of sources, everything about wildfires to the Department of Defense and whether or not military operations um, or practice operations are taking place. And so there are literally hundreds of um, feeds of information that go into this system. That was Claire Bouchier, Chicago correspondent for the Financial Times. She was speaking with my colleague, Carol Van Dam. The statue in Benny of one of the female warriors of Dahomey, which appeared in the Hollywood film The Woman King, was likely built by a sanctioned North Korean company, according to evidence discovered by VOA's Korean service. In an exclusive interview with VOA, the Benin government denies the statue was constructed by North Korea. Henry Wilkins reports from Cotonou, Benin. The female warriors of the Kingdom of Dahomey are a touch point in Benin's cultural history and a source of national pride. Their story was recently dramatised in the historical Hollywood film The Woman King. Since this statue was unveiled in Cotonou by President Patrice Talon in July 2022, it's drawn visitors from all over the country and the region. Yao Gileum is a visitor from the Ivory Coast. He says the statue is a symbol of struggle because during the time of the Dahomey warriors, more than a hundred years ago, it was almost unheard of to see women fighting instead of men and defending their territories. Aguso Shamien is from Benin. The Amazons fought for Benin for Dahomey. They were fighting women and played important roles in the country. I'm glad I came to see this statue. It's very beautiful, she says. But a recent investigation by VOA Korean discovered the statue was likely built by the Mansude Art Studio in North Korea, which is famous for creating statues of the country's dictators and through its overseas projects arm, monuments around the world. Mansude is currently under United Nations sanctions designed to stop North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un from accessing foreign currency that could help finance the country's nuclear weapons programme. The UN Security Council Sanctions Committee on North Korea, set up in 2006 to monitor the economic sanctions imposed on the country, does not speak publicly to protect the identity of its members, but it provided VOA with the following written statement on its recent investigation into the statue. The Beninois authorities' response to the panel's questions contained in that report did not allay the panel's concerns that the construction of the statue had been a clear breach of UN sanctions against North Korea and that the monies thereby gathered by the Mansude Group could have contributed to the continuing development of North Korea's weapons of mass destruction programmes. VOA spoke with Beninois Tourism and Culture Minister Babalola Jean-Michel Hervé Abimbola and presented VOA Koreans evidence to him. He says the statue was designed by a Beninois artist called Julian Sinzogan, who is well known and can be identified. Benin then turned to companies that specialise in bronze casting. As far as I'm concerned, it was made by China, but did they use Korean engineers? And if so, from which of the Koreas? I don't know. Only the foreign minister can say. The VOA Korean investigation found the order for the statue was placed by Benin's government with the Blue Dragon International Development Company, believed to be a China-based front company for Mansude. Abin Bola ended the interview by saying, this interview is no good. It must be stopped. I'm not doing it. VOA was asked to stop recording. Even when sanctions are breached, the UN has little power to enact consequences on the nations involved. Sanctions have so far proved ineffective in preventing North Korea from pursuing its nuclear weapons program. North Korean authorities did not respond to a request for comment. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Cotonou, Benin. And that's it for this Thursday, January 12th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for being our guest this morning. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I'm James Barton, Washington, saying, have a great day and be safe, whatever you do. Thank you.